the fact that you've worked with people on the monogamous side and the non-monogamous side, I suppose, what are some of the main takeaways you've seen that, that, that are the most helpful for relationships across the, the types that, that you think people listening could really help to benefit any, any of their relationships? Okay. Well, I have seven of them because this is the basis of my book. I have seven okay. life lessons. <laughs> Yeah, and we don't me. have to talk uh, very long about everyone because they'll be somewhat obvious. So the first one was create your own damn life. Is this that idea of like you have agency um, to create whatever you want, even within your relationship? You know, we've been talking about monogamy or non-monogamy. There are so many different versions of each of those things. You just create what works for you and that you're creating, you know, your happiness. Um, second, connect, connect, connect. Humans love connecting with other humans. Something else that happens, I think, in a lot of monogamous relationships is we get very busy and we have kids and all the things and we're tired at night and we stop going out together and we stop meeting new people or meeting our friends as often as we would like. And right. that is something that the non-monogamous community rocks. We go out all the time. We party. We're always meeting new people. And that is very satisfying to us humans in life. Um, the third is the emotional sovereignty. And this is very much what you were speaking about with the, I'm sorry, I keep calling him the accountability guy, but I don't know what his name was. Robert, um, Robert Hunt. Yeah. Which is I am emotional sovereignty. Here's the best way to explain it. This is the difference between you made me feel jealous and I felt jealous when. So it's flipping this kind of victim mentality around blaming our partners for emotional reactions that we have. So it's owning your own emotional stuff. It's that uh -huh. self-awareness piece. I have a perfect example of this from my own life two weeks ago. Okay. I was out with a, a really, really good friend of mine. And she and I were just going out to get a really nice dinner in a place that we've wanted to eat at for a while. <laughs> and we're waiting for it to open. And we're looking at the menu outside. And, uh, and, um, she's like, what are you going to get? And I tell her I'm like, what do you think you get? And she goes, well, I wanted to get this, but you're getting something healthy. So you're going to make me feel bad about, uh, about what I'm going <laughs> to yeah, getting. Exactly. And, 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 and I said, I go, cause I, 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 I know this dynamic. I'm like, hold on. I'm not going to make you feel anything. I'm just living my life over here, eating, yes. eating the, eating the beautiful piece of fish. So if you feel bad, that's on you. That's not exactly. on me. And she, and she laughed. She's like, all right, fine. <laughs> yes. But I think that that's a perfect example of like, perfect. I, I, I've, I've seen that a, a lot, a lot of uh, scenarios where like, you think someone is making you something, but instead you have to own how you feel. Correct. Yeah, exactly. Perfect. Thank you for illustrating that so perfectly. Um, <laughs> the fourth is love your partner, but love yourself a little bit more. Um, which is this, the relationship with yourself is actually the most important thing when you're in relationship. <laughs> so what you can bring to that relationship is really, um, very much dependent on what you, how you feel about yourself. Um, and so this kind of goes back to the codependency thing that I talked about earlier, that you don't want to be doing anything just because your partner wants it you want to be making that conscious choice that you want to do those things. And if you don't, then don't do them. Right. So you can or, love your... or if, if you want to do them for your partner, then you make a you conscious choice. You, you, yes. I love that. Yes. And so that's why I love your, love your partner, but love yourself a little bit more. Fifth is self-expression. So this is voice in terms of what we're just talking about. Here's what I want. And I'm going to tell you what I want or what I'm curious about, despite the reaction that I'm afraid you're going to have, because what I want is important and just as important what other people want. Um, and that also comes through in other ways. So I would say, especially for women growing up in the culture that we did, we get a lot of mixed messages, messages about our own sexuality. So in uh, non-monogamy and swinging in particular, this is an area that a lot of women get to explore and find this side of themselves and really express their sexuality in a new way. And I cannot tell you how transformational that is for people. And that is something that people can do in their monogamous relationships also. Let's, yeah. you know, especially if they're, especially if they're not happy with their sex life, but even if they are, what else is there? And, be finding and expressing 
all of you is very empowering. And so that's another aspect. And again, it's definitely not limited to non-monogamy. Um, the idea of personal growth, embracing uncomfortable for personal growth. And I think this is the one that can get a little trickier when you're not in non-monogamy non because what we're always, we're always doing new things. We're always meeting new people. There's always new situations. So therefore there's always kind of a lot more opportunity for this growth. So maybe if we went back to like the second point about going out more, doing new things together, meeting more people that would generate the same situations, which yeah, it might create some conflict, but working through that conflict ultimately is going to bring you closer together. And then the last one is embracing pleasure, sex and pleasure. So that's another area where our culturally growing up in a puritanical um, culture gives us a lot yeah. of mixed messages. Like I'm going to sell you sex all day long, but you should not be sexual. <laughs> sex and pleasure that is reserved for maybe men, or this is reserved for in marriage, or this is reserved for no sex and pleasure yeah. is something that all humans should be embracing well, or, for themselves. or the ridiculous idea that uh, sex is only supposed to be used for procreation like let's 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 be serious now like or, <laughs> like th that, that that's why i think it's so ridiculous that people will put like mostly religious communities will, will pitch this idea of uh of abstinence and you're mm -hmm. like have you never met a teenager like can we not just accept the hormones that are that are going through everyone's body when they're when they're when right. they're 18. So yeah, I, that, those are that's a great list. And how did how did you come up with those? Were you just thinking of like, what's worked for you going through this process with your own life? Yep. Yep. That's great. Yeah. And, and I love that you bring up the the Gottmans. I'm sure I'm sure because the more I think about the four horsemen of the uh, relationship apocalypse, yep. like, what are they again? Uh, criticism, uh, defensiveness, criticism, defenseness, stonewalling, stonewalling and contempt. Yeah. Right. The more I think about it, I think those are w widely applied to every single relationship you have. Yeah. If it's a family member, if it's a, uh, a child, if it's a friend, um, I, I think if those things are present, I think it's going to lead to a detrimental sort of relate re relationship. And so it, it's cool that you um, integrate that into all of these sort of uh, uh, scenarios. And uh, yeah, overall, I'm, I'm, thank you very much for this uh, conversation. It's really opened up parts of my mind on this that uh, I wasn't uh, uh, aware of. And